Order, order. Questions to the Secretary of State for Defence. Question number one, Mr. John McFall. Number one, sir. No, sir. The reform process in the German Democratic Republic is only in its initial stages, and it is not clear where it will lead. Mr. McFall. Tell us they must do nothing to destabilise Europe. In effect, it means that they must do nothing because they have no vision other than the status quo, yeah. rendering the Prime Minister a pygmy on the world stage compared to Mr. Gorbachev. But can the Minister state whether uh, the government are considering renegotiating the 1948 Brussels Treaty, which commits us to four divisions in Europe? And if not, what's the use of troops increasing tanks and short-range nuclear weapons? Is it to deal with the 15-mile queue of East German motorists and the Trabants heading for the West? Is that the present state of government thinking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, the government has taken the view all the way along that the NATO alliance has treated us very well. It has maintained peace in Europe for a long time. We are engaged in negotiations at the moment in Vienna to reduce uh, the Soviet levels of uh, troop levels on the other side of the border. And indeed, that is the best way to deal with these problems. Uh, Sir Anthony Buck. My honourable friend agree that if there were to be, as we hope very much, a reunification of Germany, that would no less cause there to be a need for deployment of our troops for <coughs> the foreseeable future. And therefore, the question would seem to be misguided. Yes, I think also, um, I take the point of my honourable friend, but I think that one's got to be very guarded about this. At the moment, it is extremely difficult to judge public opinion in East Germany. And indeed, from what one can see on the media, it may well be divided on this issue anyway. Mr. Le Mans. But, uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But despite what the Prime Minister said on Panorama last night, it's quite obvious that the reunification of Germany is very much on the agenda as far as Dr. Kohl is concerned, and he's already outlining steps towards that. Surely this development must have some effect on our thinking about the future of our troops in that part of the world. I do think, though, that we are thinking in terms of the long-term implications of what is due to happen in Eastern Europe, and I think it is very premature to start planning on the assumption that Germany is going to reunify when there's actually nothing to support that at all. Mr. John Brown. Would my honourable friend accept that, in essence, Mr. Gorbachev's challenge to the West is to replace the peace of deterrence with a piece of detente, although detente does not fully exist. And therefore, talk of redeployment could easily be read as reduced commitment. Should we not be very careful in considering this and not destroying the morale of our allies? Yes, indeed. And of course, what uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and what we must bear in mind all the time, is what the capability is of the Soviet Union, rather than what their intentions are today, because those intentions could change tomorrow. Mr. Jeremy Corbyn. With, mis with permission, Mr. Speaker, I shall answer this question and number 15 together. There are strict regulations that cover the security of all confidential papers and all information of a personal nature. Personal information held on computer is subject to the provisions of the Data Protection Act 1984, and disclosure of such information is made only in accordance with the Department's relevant registration. Mr. Corbyn. The Minister must be aware that confidential information held by the armed services in Northern Ireland has indeed been leaked, was indeed published in the press, and the Stevens inquiry is uh, uh, sitting at the moment looking into this particular matter. Will the Minister give us an assurance that the Stevens inquiry will not be a cover-up and not be a whitewash, and will he ensure that the Ministry of Defence's evidence to it will be published? I cannot guarantee that the Ministry of Defence's evidence will be published, but we are giving all help and cooperation with the Stevens inquiry, and there is no question of it being a whitewash. Mr. Martin Flannery. Mr. Flannery. Mr. Allison. Is my honourable friend aware that a great deal of information is retained by the Ministry of Defence which is not secret at all and really ought to be disclosed? And indeed, in one recent uh, case, there was an incident of a person who claimed a commissioned rank, which he did not hold at all, and the Ministry of Defence consistently declined to reveal that information, although it would have prevented a criminal offence from being committed. Will my honourable friend give an undertaking to the House 
that all information, even from the private files of Second World War personnel, will be disclosed if it is not actually secret? What I can say to my honourable friend is that we will disclose as much information as is humanly possible, but I cannot give him an open-ended guarantee because much of the information that we have is confidential. Mr Taylor! Will the Minister consider introducing the practice in Northern Ireland of displaying photographs of wanted persons at police stations, as happens in police stations elsewhere in the United Kingdom? Sorry, the practice of displaying the photographs of police stations, which is not done in the United Kingdom. Is, is that what he's asking? I can't guarantee that that will happen, but that's something I will certainly look into, if the Honourable Gentleman. Mr. Cran! I don't care to confirm whether his department uses electronic surveillance listening devices to gather confidential information, and if it does, what controls are exercised over the use of this equipment? Basically, um, any information that is actually gathered of this sort is confidential and it is treated as such. It's up now. Mr. Paul Boutin. Number three, sir. <coughs> War widows' pensions are a matter for the Department of Social Security. My department has, however, received a substantial number of letters and other representations suggesting that eligibility for improvements made the Armed Forces Occupational Pension Scheme in 1973 should be extended retrospectively so as to include all war widows. Mr. Boateng. The Minister must be aware that the government spends £25 million less today on war widows than it did in 1979 simply because the number of war widows has decreased through death. Why can't that money be applied to the benefit of war widows alive today? How many more years must pass? How many more war widows must die in poverty before this government realises its duty to the House and to the nation to make sure that these women who lost their husbands for us lead a decent life? The war widow's pension, which is received by all war widows, is 30% higher than the standard widow's pension. It's increased by age allowances at age 65, 70 and 80, and both the pension and those age allowances are tax-free. In addition, the war widow is able to earn a separate state retirement pension in her own right, and three-quarters of them have done so. In all these different ways, the government will recognise a special sacrifice that war widows, and especially those war widows whose husbands died in action, have made for their country. Mr. Nicholas Winterton. Does my uh, honourable friend not feel that those wives whose husbands paid the ultimate sacrifice for democracy and freedom deserve more justice from the government of the United Kingdom? And if in fact we can pay off large parts of our national debt, does he not believe that we have a debt of honour to these ladies and their families? From next April, there will be significant increases for Not war enough. widows. 85% of them receive age allowances, and 75% of them have a state retirement pension in their own right, giving ranges of income up to nearly £128 per week. Yes, we do recognise the sacrifice made by war widows, and on the record of this government, I'm confident there will be further significant increases for them in the future. Mr. Mingus Campbell. Every yeah, week after the adjournment debate, the Minister of State, who replied to that debate, accused some of those who support the cause of war widows of hypocrisy. Will the Parliamentary Under Secretary take the opportunity now provided to withdraw that charge? Does he not agree that on purely humanitarian grounds, reform is entirely justified? And if there was a free vote in the House, how do you think the House would resolve this issue? The House should remember that the Right Honourable Member for Withenshaw, when he was at this government dispatch box in 1975, took exactly the same line as I am taking today. Mr Nelson! Will friend accept that while it has often been adduced in favour of no change for the 73 widows, that uh, it would have implications for pensions elsewhere in the public sector, that many of us on both sides of the House feel that 
he and we can defend a special case in the instance of the war widows and that some justice is now overdue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now do it! Do the it. war widows are a special case, but then so are the war disabled. I don't think my honourable friend should so quickly set aside the interests of the war disabled, who also made their contribution and who make their sacrifice to this day. There would be a knock-on effect with other public sector pension schemes and the amount of £200 million for the war widows would be increased by £400 million for the war disabled. And that is every year from now until well into the next century. Mr. Martin O'Neill. Does the Parliamentary Under Secretary not appreciate that this House and the rest of the country feel that when he's cast in the role of some kind of heartless actuary that he is failing to meet the requirements of what the country wants? Will he not undertake a review both of the war widows and the war disabled to see if their plight can be met and their dignity can be restored in their, in their autumn of their years? We first have to analyse the facts as to the war widows' circumstances. As I've explained, 85% of them are on age allowances, and at age 70 that will give a pension that is 58% higher than the standard widow's pension. And at age 80 that will give them a pension 72% higher. And then if they have a state retirement pension on top of that, they have a very considerable income each week. Now we are concerned that there might be some cases of hardship, and my right honourable friend, the Minister for Social Security, offered in committee earlier this year to consider evidence of that hardship. That offer remains open. Mr. Alan Michael. Number four, sir. There was a minor incident in Cardiff on the 10th of October when a rope which was attached to one of two tugs handling HMS Sovereign parted whilst the submarine was being burst. This rope was not of the type specified by the Royal Navy for use by tugs involved in submarine berthing operations. Steps have been taken to avoid such an incident recurring. Sovereign subsequently docked without further incident and in complete safety. There is no need for changes to our emergency arrangements as a result of this incident. Mr. Alan Michael. Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister to check his facts because my understanding is that more than one rope broke. Would he not understand that the area of the City of Cardiff or any other port that was affected would be a considerably wide area of population, wider than that covered by the present emergency plans by the Government? And given that we're dealing with safety, not security here, would the Minister not agree that this should be dealt with far more openly in public discussion with the responsible local authorities? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I have checked my facts, and the fact is that more than one rope did not break. It was the same rope, and it was wrapped round three times. <laughs> also, there are always aspersions being cast on the safety of our nuclear-powered submarines by members opposite, and if they're trying to revise their defence policy to bring it in line with NATO at the moment, they should actually place some value on our nuclear-powered submarines, which have to berth in ports across this country, and the, for the crews, they are very popular when they visit uh, uh, ports in this country. David Martin! Will my honourable friend agree uh, that those of us who represent ports used by nuclear-powered uh, submarines or, nuclear or uh, submarines capable of being armed with nuclear weapons uh, deprecate those who use incidents, however minor, to pursue their obsessions against the nuclear weaponry of all kinds and that we wish to see uh, all safety procedures uh, carried out to, to the best of the, the government's ability but not to be used as vehicles for those who support CND and other organisations to whom if we had listened we would not have the disarmament in Europe that we have seen in recent times. I couldn't agree with my honourable friend more. The fact is that, that they are great value to our nuclear-powered submarines. They are hunter-killer submarines. They are capable of operating for extensive periods of time underwater, and there is no other way of actually carrying out this function without them. And it's about time the party opposite treated the crews of these boats much better. Mr. Daffin Wigley. Will the minister look again at this matter, and in doing so, will he consider the allegations that nuclear submarines have in fact had incidents uh, of tangling with the nets of fishing boats in the Irish Sea, causing the actual loss of life? Will he undertake an investigation into this and see what the implications of those incidents are? Yeah, yeah. There have been extensive investigations carried out to the question of nuclear submarines and indeed other submarines snagging the nets of fishing boats. And I can assure the honourable gentleman that all these are investigated with great care and compensation is paid where that is proved that we've done it. And there was always 
these things have always been looked into and we have always been quite happy to come forward and admit to when we've done wrong on this. But the fact is there have been a number of so-called incidents that have taken place in water which is much too shallow for submarines to operate in. Dennis Spiller. Number five, sir. Mr. Speaker, this question is almost identical to one put by my honourable friend on the 28th of June, uh, and I must refer him to the answer in column 219 and repeat that it is not possible to give an accurate assessment of the cost of civilian use of military search and rescue facilities at RAF Chevna. Mr. Speaker, sir, I thank my honourable friend for that not very far advanced reply, but is he aware that in North Devon and across the Bristol Channel, the Royal Air Force helicopters are seen as our very first and strongest line of safety at sea, and that should it ever become a case, as has been rumoured in the past, that finance becomes a problem with maintaining that service, that funds will be sought to support the defence helicopters before anything is done to remove that vital service. Well, of course, I recognise the very prominent role which my honourable friend has played in focusing public attention on this subject. But, in fact, if he is fair, he will recognise that the service has been enhanced because not the Wessex helicopters that are stationed at Chevena remain and they have been supplemented by seeking helicopters based at Carl Droz and RAF Bordy, which do, of course, have an overnight and far weather capability. Mr. John Greenway. Five, sir. Security measures at all defence establishments are kept under constant scrutiny and review. Mr. Greenway. Mr. Speaker, would my honourable friend agree that at this welcome time of reduced tension in East-West relations, the threat to our armed forces from terrorism sadly remains undiminished. In the light of recent horrific attacks on armed servicemen and their families, would my honourable friend take the opportunity for a further substantial review of security at our military bases? If there is to be any further redeployment of troops and of personnel, would he not agree with me that it would be better to perhaps look at the needs of each station commander and manpower and resources to see what can be done to improve security and protection at each of our bases? Yeah, yeah. I must reassure my honourable friend that in fact all security measures are kept constantly under review. Much more money is now being spent um, on different security measures, although I can't really go into them here. And commanding officers are in close contact on, on that whole basis. That, uh, we all condemn one at a time, Mr. Marshall. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hope you I tell hope him, Ross. I, I hope the Minister will accept that uh, we all condemn the action of terrorists against servicemen and their families. But in this time, and this threat is going to continue, will he ensure that servicemen and their immediate families are constantly vigilant uh, against these threats? And, import, and that importantly, will he ensure that this, the armed forces are themselves responsible for the security of their own base. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, we are always trying to ensure that servicemen and their families are constantly vigilant, and we hope that this will extend outside bases as well, and outside camps, to those members of the local civilian population, because they too have a great role to play in improving security. What I just uh, draw odds with, with the honourable gentleman on is the whole question of um, servicemen doing all their own guarding. I think there is a role, in fact, for civilian guards and for security firms, um, although obviously they must reach the very high standards that we set for them. For sure. Is my honourable friend aware that the balance should be struck between the needs of security and the friendships that are often established between military personnel and the community. And in the, case, in the case of my constituency, where there was a tremendously terrible IRA outrage on the Royal Marines base earlier this year, is my honourable friend aware that relationships between the Royal Marines and the community are so strong 
that people in deal would like that relationship to continue and will he do all in his power to ensure that the Royal Marines base in deal does stay in deal for the foreseeable future? I certainly hear what my honourable friend says and it was brought home very sharply to me when I went to the memorial service of the Marines at Canterbury Cathedral where there were a large number of people from the civilian population in deal and this point was made very forcibly to me and I will certainly bear it in mind. Mr. Alan McKay, sudden survey. The United Kingdom government has not incurred any additional costs in lobbying for Trident. Mr. Uh, McKay, does the Minister not think that if the United States are serious about strategic arms reduction, and I think they are, that what the Minister calls representations, and what we call in fact meddling in United States internal politics, <laughs> proves two points. One, that the nuclear deterrent, Trident, is not an independent deterrent. That's right, that's right. And two, could we not be accused, in fact, of trying to block, strike, strafe, and, in fact, interfering, and probably increasing the time that it will take for worldwide nuclear reduction in arms? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I entirely disagree with what the Honourable Gentleman has said. The strategic nuclear deterrent has been the principal contributory factor in maintaining the peace for the last 45 years. And anyone who considers rejecting or diminishing that is, uh, is uh, culpable, culpably rejecting uh, their own duty for the security of this country. As far as representations to the United States authorities go, I found that uh, in speaking both to the Chairman of the uh, Appropriations Committee and of the Armed Services Committee, both of whom I met recently, they were entirely convinced of the necessity of this system, and in fact this has been shown by the fact that the funding has been reinstated. Mr. Ian Taylor. Can my honourable friend uh, give us the latest progress on the trials of the Trident system in the United States? And does he, agree, does he agree that it's important that these trials are successful so that we can deploy Trident as early as possible according to the timescale of the 1990s for the continued security of this country? The trials resume at the beginning of December and uh, my information from the United States Navy is that they assume that they will be successful. Dr. Dick Douglas! Would the Minister reflect not just on the costs of the representation, but on the effectiveness of the representation which we are making to the United States. Has he seen the report from the Brookings Institute which casts grave doubt on whether the United States themselves should proceed with the D5? And what happens to the so-called independent deterrent if the United States themselves relinquish the, art, the conception of going ahead with a D5 missile? Yeah. Well, I don't, know about the, I don't know about the Brookings Institute, but everybody that I spoke to in Washington uh, was a, com entirely convinced of the necessity of their system. And the fact that Congress withheld funds after three test-firing failures seems to me a perfectly reasonable way of applying pressure, but that funding has been reinstated and the test program starts again on the 1st of December. Mr. Roger Moat, number eight, sir. My right honourable friend will meet Mr Cheney today at the meeting of NATO's Defence Planning Committee in Brussels, where NATO's force plans will be discussed. Mr Roger Moat! It's not the essential point to remember that there are still over half a million Russian troops in East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia and Hungary, and that any premature dismantling of our NATO defences would, would threaten and jeopardise the peace and freedom of Europe for which NATO has fought so hard over the last 40 years. And would my honourable friend agree that it is vital that we keep as close as possible both to the United States administration and to the United States Congress to ensure that there is no weakening in our mutual resolve? Yes, of course, my honourable friend is absolutely right. And what we've got to look at always is the capability of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact rather than their intentions, which of course can always change at relatively short notice. And those capabilities have been further enhanced by new production of Soviet war materials of one sort or another, which have actually improved the quality, although the quantity may have come down by a little. Mr. Ron Brown. But, um, obviously, what Donald is saying, one thing, one thing has to be remembered. Individuals are important. And this government always talks about individuals. And one individual is Paddy Meehan. I wrote this book, Frame by MI5. Oh, order! Order! 
Order. No, just a minute. Has it got anything to do with this question? Because the contents, Mr. Speaker, the contents should be considered by this House. Or at the very least. No, order. 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 The honourable gentleman. Sit down, please. Bring him down, please. Now, order. The honourable gentleman must ask his own question. No, I think we really can't have that. Right. You, sir. You, <laughs> sir. Ask a question. Will my honourable friend uh, accept that uh, the remarks by our right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, to his NATO colleagues today from the United States uh, and our European allies, that we should gang warily? in the case of redeployment and reduction of forces in Europe is very welcome on this side of the House because any moves which we make in this direction ought to be thoroughly agreed with our NATO colleagues, not done one-off by individual countries and should be firmly within the framework of agreements between East and West. Yeah. 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 Of course, that is absolutely right and we must continue to rigorously pursue the existing talks that are going on in Vienna at the moment under the CFE arrangements, and that, of course, will lead to major reductions in Soviet superiority of numbers, and then after that, we can perhaps start thinking about uh, significant reductions on the NATO side. Mr. Rod Mr. Ma Mr. Speaker, the Minister of State aware that it's only the Secretary of State and the Prime Minister who seem to be prepared to carry on waging the Cold War. And it will he, and it will he also agree well, he also agree that while force levels may take some time to reduce by negotiations, that it should be possible for this government to follow the lead given by Lord Carrington, the former Foreign Secretary and General Secretary of NATO, who has said in the last week that there is now no case for short-range nuclear forces in the form of a follow-on to Lance. Will the government not make that contribution to ending the Cold War and abandon this folly? No, the government feels it's much better to do everything in cooperation with our allies and the honourable gentleman opposite knows as well as I do that we have all signed up to the comprehensive concept that agrees that there is still a need for a mix both of conventional and nuclear forces and for the need of flexible response. It is only actually the Labour Party which is out of step with the rest of Europe at the moment and not the government. Mr Julian Brazier. My honourable friend agree, Mr Speaker, that any such discussions must take full account of the Soviet Union's continuing massive chemical capability. This is particularly underlined both by the continuing secrecy surrounding the Shikani plant and by the chilling revelation that lethal chemical weapons were used in Georgia for the purposes of crowd control. It's absolutely right. We, we have no evidence whatsoever that the stocks of chemical weapons in the Soviet Union have been reduced. And indeed, as my honourable friend says, um, the injuries sustained at Tbilisi um, were not those that you would expect from such riot dispersal agents as CS gas. Mr. Ron Davis. Number nine, sir. We are continuing to study a number of options for the replacement of the United Kingdom's free-fall nuclear bomb. The expenditure to date has been negligible. Mr. Ron Davis. But, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister explain why we are spending any money at all on developing a new nuclear weapon system which will probably be negotiated away before it's even commissioned? With the Berlin Wall coming down, with democracy breaking out all over Eastern Europe, with peace in the air, what sense at all is there in developing new nuclear weapons and keeping up this obsession with the Cold War? This, this system is not covered because it is not ground-based. But in fact, I believe that one cannot predict the, the pattern of diplomatic alignments within 20 years. I cannot say where the United Kingdom's addresses may be found or in what part of the globe they may exist. But any prudent government is obliged to update all our weapon systems in order to ensure that our forces have the best equipment available because the lead time in these systems is so long when they next have to face an enemy. Mr. Wilkinson. Is it not the case that as it will politically become probably more difficult to modernize our short-range nuclear forces with a direct follow-on to Lance, that it's all the more important to 
procure an air launch system which is inherently more flexible and potentially of greater range? And could he therefore say what specific options are being studied as a replacement, particularly so as the modular standoff weapon program is not one which the United Kingdom is now pursuing? Yeah, my honourable friend, in fact, reinforces the conclusion in paragraph 92 of the Select Committee report and uh, I can't go into too great detail, as he will appreciate, but we are certainly considering both American and French options. Rogers! Both today and in previous parliamentary questions, the Minister has refused to comment on the replacement for a free-fall bomb. But will the Minister affirm or deny today that, in fact, an agreement has been signed between uh, the United Kingdom and the United States for a standoff missile to be deployed on tornado aircraft? No such agreement has been signed and uh, the honourable gentleman would accept the fact that as I say we've only spent uh, the, the expenditure has been negligible and these studies are in an exceedingly early stage. Mr Jeremy Handley. We remain committed to NATO whose policies of seeking dialogue were with the East while maintaining a strong collective defence have contributed greatly to the change taking place in Eastern Europe. Mr. Handley. Mr. Speaker, whatever has been said this afternoon, is it not true that the developments in the Warsaw Pact have indeed been most hopeful and are most exciting? Yeah. 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 However, because, because this will lead to uncertainty, and indeed, as we've seen in the past, in Poland, in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia, and indeed in China, there can also be, with reform, a most terrible response could my honourable friend make sure that he proceeds with caution and that the hopes of all of these nations should it not be reduced because of the uncertainty that reform can bring? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I can give my honourable friend that reassurance and it will be very, very, almost a miracle, I think, if the road to reform is both smooth and straightforward. And I think we are indeed uh, um, faced, in fact, by a period of definite uncertainty and during this time we want to keep our defences sound and we do not want to indulge in unilateral disarmament which is so advocated by the party opposite. Changes, favourable changes in Eastern Europe and President Gorbachev's enormous arms cuts in the Soviet Union. How can this government justify a change in defence policy in this country as announced in the autumn statement which added a billion pound a year each year to our defence budget? How can that possibly be justified in the present political situation? Because as, as I've said to the House earlier, although we have seen small reductions in terms of the Soviet capability, and when we talk about 500,000 troops, that must be compared with a total of 5 million men under arms in the Soviet Union. And during that time, the Soviet arms production has continued apace, and a large number of new tanks, aircraft, and submarines, and ships, and so forth, have all been produced, which have actually enhanced their capability. Sir Richard Buddy! In considering this matter further, would my honourable friend bear in mind that on a per capita basis in relation to the gross domestic product, this country is now spending four times more on defence than Western Germany. And given the renewed economic strength of Germany, is that altogether a reasonable distribution of the burden of defending Central Europe now? The percentage of our GNP spent on defence is somewhat higher than that of the Germans, but one has to bear in mind, of course, that they have a conscript army with whom they pay much less than our professional forces. And I don't think that the amount that we spend on defence is any way out of line, considering the commitments that we have. To Frank Doran. Mr Speaker, the government would be ready to pay appropriate compensation wherever the Crown's legal liability were established, and where there were firm evidence to show that on the balance of probabilities, ex-servicemen had suffered ill health as a result of exposure to radiation during the course of their duties as members of the armed forces. In the absence of any such evidence, special compensation for nuclear test veterans could not be justified. Mr. Doran. Mr. Speaker, that's as grudging and as penny-pinching a response as one we've had to the Minister's answer uh, to the War Widows Pension issue. Is it not the case, Mr Speaker, that, the, that these service personnel were injured in the course of their, of their duties, that there are many examples of the leukaemia cases which have gone uncompensated 
And does not the government's recent response, grudging and minimal though it was, to those haemophiliacs who contracted the HIV virus, provide a precedent for the government to act with a little more compassion in this particular case? The Honourable Member is not correct. The findings of the National Radiological Protection Board, which were published last year, supports the government's view that no harm due to ionizing radiation was suffered by participants in the program. However, the report did show a slight increase in the rate of occurrence of certain leukemias and multiple myeloma, which although providing no firm evidence of a link with radiation exposure, did raise enough doubt to allow the Department of Social Security medical advisors to regard such illnesses as attributable to service. Mr. Bellingham! Is the Minister aware that a number of members of the Royal Northern Regiment were involved in observing these tests? Now, many of them have since died, but there is evidence that many did suffer ill health. And can you assure the House that if a compensation scheme is brought in, the widows of those personnel will not be forgotten? Mr. Speaker, in response to my honourable friend, it's true that as we all grow older, illness increases, but I can only reiterate the report showed no link with radiation in those tests in the Pacific, but that if such a link were established and a new report has been commissioned to update the figures for a further five years, then appropriate compensation would be considered by the government as a matter of legal liability. Ashley. Mr. Speaker, is the Minister aware that there is a, a deep and brooding sense of injustice among British nuclear test veterans? And I am their patient, and I know how very deeply they feel about the injustice of not being paid. But if the Minister is so certain of his answer, how does he explain the fact that the United States government pays their nuclear test patterns for 13 cancers and the British government pays nothing. The right honourable gentleman's part in this campaign is well known and he pursues it with his customary vigour in this house and outside. But I have to tell him that it's not the government's finding that there is no link it is the independent finding of the National Radiological Protection Board and their report is, is endorsed by the authority of Sir Richard Doll, the eminent professor. As to the American experience, the circumstances aren't comparable and in any case are a matter for the American authorities. The level trotter! Vickers defence systems have satisfactorily passed the first milestone in the Challenger 2 Mark II demonstration phase. Mr. Trotter! Does my honourable friend accept that it would be wrong for the British Army to have to depend upon imports for so important a part of its equipment as the main battle test? Order! And can he confirm that if Vickers continue to make such good progress and achieve milestones 2 and 3 next year as planned, then a production contract for Challenger 2 will follow. Of course, I very much welcome the progress that vicars are making, but I must refer my honourable friend to what my honourable, right honourable friend, the former Secretary of State for Defence, said on the 20th of December 1988, when this subject was discussed at great length by the House in column 284, when he told the House that we are taking a staged approach to this procurement, which will enable us to keep our options open for the future if that proves necessary. Mr. Clement! But the, the previous Secretary of State also said that uh, he very much hoped that Vickers would produce uh, an adequate prototype and would, in the end, win the contract. Is this the view of the current Secretary of State? And if so, can the Minister tell us why it is that the Ministry of Defence is actively supporting the Department of Trade and Industry in sponsoring a tour of Britain by Vickers' main rival, General Dynamics of the USA. The tour by General Dynamics, which in fact they are paying for, is connected with the uh, principle of banking offset arrangements, which is a very good one from which British industry benefits. And in fact, most of the subjects which are under discussion relate to offsets unconnected with any uh, armoured vehicle procurement. Everybody miss! 
The total value of new contracts signed for United Kingdom defence exports from 1979 to the end of 1988 is approximately £31 billion pounds at historic prices. Mr. MS, is my honourable friend aware that many jobs in Basildon depend upon defence yeah, contracts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would he please tell the House what he believes the impact on defence exports would be by the establishment of the Defence Conversion Agency as advocated by the Labour Party? It is absolutely absurd that those parts of British industry which are most successful in the export field should be forced to desist from something that they are doing well and diverted into something which is thought to be socially acceptable, whoever is a judge of what is socially acceptable, and it, this certainly illustrates why the Labour Party is so reluctant to go into any detail about it, their various policy proposals. 